Hello and welcome to another episode of This Is Not A Book Club. It feels like it's been a long time. It has been a long time since we recorded the last episode. Yeah. Um, it feels like it's been a marathon since then. Oh, no, listen, we're not doing that again. The amount of comments I got after the last episode, we're not, I'm not saying that word. Okay. You can say it. I'm never saying it. Okay, that's it. What so, word? No. Not yet. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's good to be back. Yeah. Um, how's life? This is a small talk segment that we always do. Wow, you know life's been crazy. <laughs> that, that's going to be a whole podcast okay, itself. Let's, let's I'm not going to ask you Just as well fine. because, yeah, amazing. Yeah? Fine. Yeah, well, fine is better. Fine. Fine. Yeah. Fine. Great. Um, so I, I think just, I guess now we have relatively regular listeners. Like we had someone comment on YouTube asking for when the next podcast was coming out, which was nice. That's really nice. Um, and also felt a bit bad because we haven't actually recorded it. But here we are now doing it, which yeah. is good. Um, but we, I guess to summarize for people that are new to the podcast and what we're trying to do, mm. essentially we're talking about books. Um, so we're, we're looking at books that are, I guess that we're interested in yeah. and we're hoping other people are and kind of summarizing the books and then talking and exploring the different themes yeah. in the books. Yeah. And, and also going beyond that. So it's not just a summary of the book, but it's also going deeper what we think about it do mm. we think it's practical the parts of it that we've tried yeah like the last episode where you had tried some of the things in the book yeah and uh, thank yeah. you yeah yeah so, so it's, not, I'm just saying not, that it's beyond the summary, yeah, you know, yeah, because yeah. for me, it's very important not to share something that I either don't believe in or haven't tried. Yeah. So And I think also for a lot of people, like I've read, so the first book we did was The Honest Truth About Dishonesty. Yeah. And I'd read that years ago and I, I didn't quite know how to reconcile that with my understanding of the world. And I think yeah. often with psychology, self-help, personal development books, yeah. it's like you can choose to subscribe to the philosophy 100% and get lost in that world and struggle to to reconcile that with real life yeah. or you can take the good from it critically analyze and dissect the other parts but sometimes that's not always easy yeah um so i guess that's what we're trying to do is have that conversation yeah and for this to be like almost like a reading companion yeah to supplement people's yeah, reading it's, of the it's book. as if we're all reading together yeah which explains why this is not a book club <laughs> <laughs> yes but you know that actually is a very important thing because like a lot of the times the book is from let's say worldview or a perspective that's like a little bit different to yours mm. and if you don't manage to like create a bridge between them or know how to integrate that with yours yeah you get a set of information that may be useful but because it's not really integrated with your worldview you may forget it you may struggle with it it may fragment your view of the world so what we're trying to do is to create those bridges mm -hmm. and integrate it with maybe a larger perspective that the audience may have. And, and this would really help them remember it more, because makes it more practical for them. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's yeah. the plan. Yeah. So in terms of this week's book, last last uh, last podcast, we looked at uh, David Goggins Can't Hurt Me. Yeah. Um, which was a very different book to, very to this different. week's. Although different, but what actually inspired us to do this one? was it, it, You're right, actually, because I, I think in, in David Goggins' uh, story, a lot of his journey is kind of embedded in, in traumas that he faced early on in life. Yeah. And so we thought, let's explore the topic of trauma. Yeah. Um, and so you suggested this book, which is The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel Fan... The Colk? Is well, that how you want me to pronounce it? The fan part, I'm sure that's it. I, I, I mean, I, I think that's it. The rest of it, I've got no idea. Okay. Although he did mention his name in the audiobook. Oh, really? So I, I think it was similar to what you said. Okay, yeah. great. It's no offense if we got that wrong. So uh, I'll just read a quick bio like I always do. I that's think all that's right a with you. good idea. All right. So Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, MD, is a fan. renowned... Fan, yeah. the Kolk, MD, is Imagine a renowned that. psychiatrist, researcher, and author specializing in trauma. He's the founder of the Trauma Center in Massachusetts and a, professor and a professor of psychiatry at Boston University School of Medicine. Dr. Fan de Kolk. Fan? Fan. I think fan. Okay, fine. I hope it's not fun. Could it be fun? It's fine. Yeah. Uh, his groundbreaking book, The Body Keeps a Score, has had a significant impact on trauma studies and treatment. His work focuses on understanding the effects of trauma on the mind and body, and he continues to contribute to the field through research, clinical practice, and training programs. So in, in a few words, how would you summarize this book? So this is like almost like a Bible on trauma. Mm. 
and maybe I can say it in sentence, when something really scary happens to you or like life threatening happens to you, how does your body and the brain deal with that? And the long uh, lasting impact of that incident uh, and ways of getting out of it. So I think that's like a summary of the book. I think it, uh, he spends the first half of the book um, giving you an understanding of trauma. Yeah. Um, and he kind of, he, he, he uses a lot of his own experiences um, working with veterans, for example, yeah. um, and, and rape victims and trauma victims generally, as well as uh, studies that he cites and everything else. And I think uh, just jumping in in terms of themes and things that I found yeah. very interesting, the first thing was for me, I think a lot of people maybe look at trauma as like, okay, it's something in your head. And like, you know, mm. something's happened to you. Now it's, it's a psychological thing. Yeah. Um, but he very kind of clearly demonstrates and shows in many different ways how there are physiological impacts yeah. and how your body reacts. So he talks about um, veterans, for example. And there's one thing where he gets, I can't remember what the studies, uh, what, what the thing's called when they get them to look at like blobs of ink mm. um, on, a, on a piece of paper. And... Uh, I think there was he did this study with a bunch of veterans and and quite a few of them on the second card they it's just a blob of ink but they described really vivid um things that they had experienced in war mm. like oh this is my this is my um uh comrade James and I can see he was you know uh, like he's dying like, and torn this, into pieces like, yeah, yeah basically yeah, blown to pieces whatever things. and what What's interesting is that in that process, obviously, like they begin to sweat and like literally it's as if they're back in that moment. Yeah. Um, and, and he kind of he went on his own journey and he kind of illustrates it in the book in, in terms of understanding and dissecting what trauma is and how it affects us. Yeah. Um, and I think for someone like myself as like a um, an outsider, let's say, in this whole kind of psychology uh, field, it was really interesting to try and understand because. I think nowadays trauma, is, as we were discussing earlier, trauma is like a buzzword. Yeah. So when the second definitely. you say trauma, it's like everyone wants to talk about this and everyone has their own versions of trauma, yeah. um, which are legitimate. But actually getting to the bottom of what this means and, and, and how it impacts us yeah. is, is a completely different thing. Yeah, exactly. So, and I think that's one thing which this book does a very good job of, of doing. Because as you said, right now, everyone's talking about trauma. And by everyone, I mean everyone who is already talking about it. Like, it, it's become very popular right now. Mm. And a lot of people who are talking about it are not really experts, are the people who've come to this world maybe the last four or five years. But the author of The Body Keeps This Score is like a veteran of trauma, you know. Right now, he's almost like eight years old. Mm. He's been in this for a very long time. So his explanation of trauma is maybe one of the most reliable if anyone is looking to understand like what trauma is, its impacts on the body, the brain, life. So I think that's what makes this book a very good source for anyone who wants to you know learn about trauma like i feel like maybe reading this and studying it really would be better than doing a few workshops with um, some people who right now are trying to talk about trauma so and, and one of the good things is as you said like he he really goes maybe f not just half of the book i think uh, maybe the the first like 50 60 70 percent of the book is just explaining trauma what it is and he's been in this field for such a long time mm. so listening to his own life story you also get to see the difference in attitudes that the culture has had towards trauma yeah, yeah. like how for example you see a few years ago they didn't even consider trauma a real thing then slowly slowly like different attitudes so i think you touched upon a good like um place to start the discussion because there's so many things we can say yeah and that is like the impact trauma has on the person's view of the world later on. When those um, veterans looked at that ink and they read into it tra um, terrible and tragic things that had happened to them, this shows that after a trauma, like one of the impacts of going through trauma, which is like this difficult thing happens to you, after that, parts of your brain are impacted, which make you see more danger in the world. Like the parts in the brain responsible for assessing if this is a dangerous situation or not may be hyperactivated and you see danger in situations which is not dangerous. Like that's one of the things, for example, that could happen. And it's not just for war veterans, even it shows that for children who'd gone through like um, developmental trauma, 
they would show the same set of photos, normal photos from daily lives, like just a pregnant woman, I don't know, a person sitting by the window, different things, to people who hadn't had difficult experiences in childhood and teenagers who had. Mm. The ones who had would interpret the same photo as a very gloomy, dangerous, sad situation with no way out. But the kids who didn't have that like difficult childhood experience, adverse childhood experience, they would look at the situation and even if they saw sadness into it, they would find a way out. One example of it was very interesting for me. So in that, there's the silhouette of a, pra a pregnant lady and the people with trauma said, yeah, someone must have left her mm, or betrayed yeah, 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 yeah. her and whatnot. The other ones were like, even if someone betrayed her, she's going to find another partner or something like this, which is very interesting. Prior to trauma, the brain helps the person find a way out. Like, even if it's difficult, it'll be. And, and this is maybe the fundamental thing about trauma, like one of the fundamental things about trauma, which is it changes our view of the world without us even knowing. Mm -hmm. We perceive all the events of life as dangerous, as there's no hope, the world is not a very, and sometimes it impacts even our view of ourselves. I'm not the kind of person that can deal with it. I'm not the kind of person that can do this, etc. So, So this is maybe one of the, angles of talking about trauma what's its impact on our worldview and and there was also you reminded me of an example that he gave with uh, a study on rats mm. and and they, they basically looked at rats that had more contact time with their mothers mm. immediately after birth so i, I think rats that uh, the, the mothers would lick their um their babies and and the the rats that had been touched and licked more by the by the mothers immediately after birth when they were put into um, situations that could have induced anxiety or fear or whatever, they fared a lot better yeah. than rats that didn't have that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think it, it got me thinking about how like, you know, with, with humans, they, they encourage um, contact time. So skin to skin contact yeah. immediately after birth. Yeah. Um, and, and it's common with amongst all animals. Yeah. Um, but th there's a really interesting, and he talks about childhood uh, quite extensively in the yeah. book as well. Yeah. And, and how, having that formative um, and supporting structure for young people. And again, sorry, just related to that, another example he gave, which blew my mind, was he talked about kids that were, had been through a war and the kids that remained in their homes with their families whilst under bombardment and being shelled and whatever, versus kids who were sent away to live in in the you know um, safer zones sa yeah safer areas but but not with their parents so they yeah. were sent to live with extended family those kids um had more trauma and manifested more issues later on in life yeah. uh, which is which is mind-blowing because crazy we always think crazy. we always think that it's everything outside and if you keep your kids safe physically yeah uh whether it's with you or or, or away from you that's fine as long yeah. as they're physically safe but actually mentally being with their parents and, and having that support is so important. So important, yeah. Which is, I think, maybe one of the most important facts about trauma, that it's not the scary, life-threatening event that causes trauma. It's going through that without support. Mm. And so he says social support, family support, is the strongest protection against trauma, Yeah. which that example you mentioned clearly shows it. They were in a safer position, those children that were sent away, but because their parents were not there, they could not talk about it. They could not um, see others next to them. They, they actually got more trauma, which is very interesting. Another thing that he, um, he mentioned the study of was that in a lot of these situations, children look to their parents to understand uh, what, what, how should we feel. Yeah. So if the parents are calm in a situation, the children would be calm. But if the parents panic, the children panic too, which is very interesting. Like, I really love that chapter on childhood in the book because I feel like trauma has a lot to do with that. Like, in so many ways, trauma and childhood are connected. One of the ways is what you already mentioned, like children who were nurtured, had good attachment with their caretakers, later on are less likely to, to grow trauma. But the opposite is also, unfortunately, very much true. Like, if you had a very safe, good caretakers, good environment, you're going to be stronger in the face of trauma. But it's not like if you don't have them later on trauma can hit you. No, the lack of good enough caretaking would actually lead to trauma itself, which is what he calls 
developmental trauma. So this is another thing that I think in the last maybe few decades it became known that trauma doesn't necessarily need to be like you in a war zone or like a life act. No, even consistent neglect of parents could lead to trauma, which is why a lot of people don't know they, they're acting like someone was trauma, but they can't like think of any event in their life that, mm. that did it. But just like not being seen, not being appreciated long term, by parents who maybe were going through their own issues, you know, for whatever reason, um, can also lead to developmental trauma. So also, it's, it's just reminded me. I don't know if you remember. There was a viral clip a few years ago um, from from the war in Syria, mm. and there was a father and his daughter, and he he taught his daughter to basically like laugh hysterically whenever a, a bomb landed on the house, um, or, or not on the house, sorry, in in, in the area, because yeah. obviously it's very scary and very yeah. traumatic potentially, and, and and you know PTSD. A lot of people yeah. stem, uh, get PTSD from these kind of things. But I found that like it, it's it's a, almost a parallel here where they were in a very extreme situation, but having that support and having that relationship and and being with family is what, what was able to help them through it. Yeah. And I think from the outside, it's almost hard to understand and and to to rationalize almost. But but like you said, when you do a deep dive, and I'm conscious of the fact that the word that I said on the podcast loads of times allegedly you've said trauma more times already in the like first 15 minutes of this podcast i think this is going to be yeah yeah <laughs> you're going to outdo me in, in, in that way but um yeah but yeah it, it's it, it's fascinating i think for me like i was i was trying to as i was reading the book i was trying to understand um human beings and it sounds a bit weird but like i, yeah. I was trying to understand because everyone goes through their own issues in life and it manifests in different ways and I was I was trying to to see what the uh, side effects or or what impact experiences people might have had, um, why they act a certain way yeah. today, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And 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 I think he he kind of you know in in the various different examples that he gives of trauma that people experience, you see that it's so wide ranging. So wide ranging. Um, yeah. And it's it's a it's a relative thing. So there's no one act. You know, in, in a certain neighborhood, for example, seeing someone being killed might be very normal but in another neighborhood that's like the most traumatic thing you can experience yeah. um and and everyone kind of uh i guess deals and processes these things in in entirely different ways yeah. for you what were the other so we've talked about childhood we've talked about um the, the the physiological side and i think just one thing to add on that very quickly is he, he talks about the the physical pain and people get um chronic pain which is a, a, a physical manifestation of like pent-up trauma yeah um which i found again fascinating yeah yeah but what were the key things for you in this book um that you thought were were yeah pertinent this is one of those difficult questions because i genuinely think the body keeps the score could be five different books Oh, yeah, it was long. You know, not just that it's long. The content is gold mm. because right now there are so many books in, in, in like w which the editor has made them longer because they say it has to be at least three to four hundred pages for it to sell. Yeah, this is not like that. This is good content mm. on attachment. Good content like those who are therapists or know about the attachment styles. Amazing content there about trauma, good content. It's a very dense and good book in terms of like how many good points it has. For me, there were so many interesting things. Um, uh, like one of it is like how, as you said, trauma can impact in different ways, and we mentioned some of it. Like, um, but there's many. Like one, it could it could lead to hyper arousal. Um, so the person may find it very difficult to remain calm or to to to, to relax enough to enjoy uh, things that require you to relax, like, yeah. you know, play, have a nice time with family because they're always hyper aroused. Or it could do the complete opposite because the person is trying to numb down their emotions too much that then th they're, they're disconnected from life and they're depressed. Um, it can impact memory. It can, uh, the person may find it that in order not to feel uh, or remember any emotion that is associated with that difficult uh, event, they may completely shut down their memories and emotions to the extent that then they don't feel pleasure. One of it was the somato sensory things that it could come into their in their body, the soma. Mm. So, um, so, so yeah, th that's another interesting thing. Uh, th there are so many interesting places we can go 
Um, the, the, I, I think maybe one thing that now we can discuss as well. By the way, how much time have we got? Oh, we're, we're, we're good for time. Ten. So should we go towards the treatments then? Because that's a very interesting thing as well. There was one thing as you were talking, which I wanted to bring up, but I've now forgotten. Uh, maybe I'll bring it up. But what I was going to say is yeah. that, you know, when you talk about it, it could be multiple books. I feel like, you know, like you said, 50, 60 percent was about understanding trauma. And then the second part was the treatments. Exactly. Which was equally fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Because, it, you know, I think most people, uh, when you talk about therapy, most people have heard of CBT, yeah. cognitive behavioral mm, therapy. And that's mm -hmm. like, I think, one of the most common mm -hmm. forms of therapy, like uh, the NHS offer that in the UK yeah. um, as like your standard. If you have any issues, basically do CBT. Yeah. Um, but he introduces various other practices. And I think I'm hoping you'll be able to shed more light on them. I think this is actually a very good discussion to have. Yeah. Um, so therapies, <clears throat> let's go with his thingy, like way of categorizing mm. it. It can be categorized into two. So we can say talking therapies and other types of therapy. For a lot of people, when we when we say therapy, their mind may go to talking therapies. Like that's when you sit with a therapist and you're like, we'll talk about what has happened or talk about something. And the idea is that through talking to each other, we'll either find the solution or find the root of the issue. Yeah. Talking about talking therapies in the context of trauma, the idea is that the person has tried to either consciously or subconsciously avoid thinking remembering the trauma so it's stuck in the past even if their mind explicitly forgets about it the body is remembering the trauma so the idea is that by revisiting it in the safe context of the therapy room this thing that's now been locked in the past but it's still impacting our life will go open it up and hopefully we'll manage to process it in a better way yeah so that it's not this thing that we've ignored it but because we've ignored it, it doesn't mean that it's ignoring us, right? So they say, let's talk about it. Let's go to the therapy. Sorry, let's go to that trauma and process it. And th he's got interesting discussions there that is just talking about that trauma, is revisiting it en is enough, or do you have to, for example, Peter Levin that he cites, he says that, no, just revisiting a trauma is not enough. It actually may cause another trauma, mm. but you have to receive what you wish you had received back then, which is that support. Because we said it's the event plus lack of support that leads to trauma. So you revisit the event and the brain really thinks it's there. Now, if it gets that support, then the trauma may it be can heal, yeah. Yeah, processed differently. Now, so, so this is what talking therapies aim to do. But within talking therapies, we have different modalities. So we have CBT, um, which is, you know, one of the ways, as you said, like a lot of people know about it. And that's because it's so easy to um, to to offer it. They say six sessions, eight sessions, yeah. <laughs> although not that CBT therapists would be happy with that. But there are many different types, for example, psychoanalysis. Um, there's uh, psychodynamic, uh, there's there's IFS, which he later on talks about. So these are the talking therapies, although IFS sometimes gets actually... IFS evolved. is the integrated family. Yeah, although that one actually goes beyond being a talking therapy mm. and actually... Is that the one where he has people in the room? You structure them. Okay, yeah, we, we'll talk about that in the... We will talk about yeah. that because so, I, I found so that really interesting. Yeah, so let's say this was the talking therapy bit. Yeah. That me... Like, go to the therapist. I go to the therapist. The therapist tries to talk to me. Go there. Blah, blah, blah. Now, the way the therapist tries to do this would be different based on the modality of the therapy. So, psychodynamic, which I think would be a very good discussion for us to have another day. Mm. What is the difference between all of these psychoanalysis, psychodynamic, um, CBT, and all of these different types of modalities? DBT, again. Um, DBT as well is, is a modality that came to being out of because they saw the shortcomings of some other modalities. For example, working with people who have um, uh, borderline personality disorder, there is a lot of these talking therapies don't work, so they came with DBT. DBT is interesting. It's, it's a talking therapy, but it's more than that. Like you have support system. Anyways, so these are the talking therapies, but he also talks about other types of therapies, which... The idea is that will help you, but doesn't necessarily require you talking. 
So he then mentions a large range of these EMDR. Mm. Uh, although in EMDR... Can you briefly explain what EMDR is? Yeah. So EMDR is... Uh, the, the idea of it is that it, 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 what helps it is the rapid movements of the eye in, in different directions, right? Um, and it's, they came across this apparently by luck. And they don't exactly know how EMDR works, but the idea, he says, is that it, it, it's hoping maybe to imitate the brain's natural way of processing information when we're sleeping. REM sleep, basically. Apparently, yeah. when we're sleeping, the brain manages to process information in ways that we can't do when we're awake. So they think by doing this rapid movements of the eye, yeah. uh, it imitates that process. Now, sometimes the, it may be accompanied by talking to the therapist. So the therapist says, for example, let's remember the, that traumatic incident and do that. But sometimes he said, for example, I did this even for people who I didn't speak the language. Like he mentions, I did this for a person with Swahili. Mm. So it, it, it means that maybe just, just, just try to go to that moment and, and do that. And the interesting thing is you don't even need to tell the therapist the trauma. So um, it, it, it's just that as long as the person themselves go to that difficult moment and then they do this, they say it helps the brain process that information, basically. But exactly how it works, we said we don't know. So that was one of the things. Yeah. Another one was theater. God, all of these are so interesting. Well, we don't have time to talk about them, like how theater helps. I, I, I think as, as dense as I found the book, yeah. Um, I think it was definitely really enlightening, especially, like I said, the, the treatments in the second half, like like yeah. how he talks about how they use theatre with inner city kids, for example, yeah. and got them to be able to... So, so I, I think just to give an example, they had inner city kids act out certain scenarios and they had, for example, a kid was being bullied and like beaten up. And then they would ask one of the kids in the, in the crowd to kind of step in yeah. and say what they would do in that scenario. And overwhelmingly at the beginning, they would all side with the aggressor and would beat up the kid because yeah. in their understanding of the world, weakness was a vulnerability, was they, a vulnerability they didn't, they couldn't, they yeah. couldn't have. And then as they kind of uh, developed and, and did this more, they got the, the children to kind of open up and understand their vulnerability and be able to be confident enough to, to, to kind of come forward and, and, be honest and real and, and, and yeah. at least understand that side of themselves. And and I think, again, he spoke about like at the end of the, the course that they did at this particular school, the reception that they got from the kids and like there were tears and, you know, so many thank yous and whatever. And, and they had fundamentally just changed through theater, through acting and being able to kind of express themselves yeah. because sometimes it's so difficult for people to express themselves as themselves. Yeah. They have to play a role and within that, they're able to unpack and, and deal with their, their yeah. kind of trauma. Um, yeah, that, or, or that music one. Do you remember that scene? He says, I went to this place that they were victims of sexual abuse and rape. Mm. And he says, I walked into this room and everyone is just like, like, you know, and it's like lifeless sitting down. No one's talking. There's no energy in the room. And then up till someone starts playing the, the African drum. He says, as soon as the person starts the, playing the drum, it's like everyone, the rhythm, mm. everyone got into the rhythm. They got up and it broke them back to life. That was v very interesting for me that uh, the, the, the power of this collective harmonious action, how it brought people out of their, you know, like personal struggle with that mm. trauma and but animated he, he them. said it's used by by communities and, yeah. and tribes for example where yeah. where they they process and deal with grief and trauma with Absolutely. things like drums and and whatever else yeah um there was also i, I just b before we carry on talking about the treatment side of things there was one thing i remembered now what i wanted to say was he he also spent some time talking about um drugs when it comes to treatment for yeah, trauma yeah, yeah. And and essentially, I, I think the the summary and correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like the summary of it is that he's he's quite anti the use of of uh, drugs overall um, in terms of in terms of dealing with trauma, simply because they or, or, or the argument that he makes that obviously they can be used and they can be effective in certain cases and whatever, but the blanket approach at the moment in in the U.S. and maybe in the U.K. as well is to prescribe drugs because what they do is that they numb the the symptoms of the trauma rather than actually doing the work and dealing with 
the root cause. Is yeah. that a fair assessment? Uh, uh, I would say he, yeah. Uh, so so may, maybe I would say it this way. He's not anti-drugs for trauma uh, b- because that is um, a position that a lot of people are taking anti-psychiatry, mm. but he's not. He says, I prescribe drugs myself. Yeah, yeah. But he he's i think what i like about him is that he says i try to look at it scientifically what does the data tell us so for some people he says actually it helps them like he mentions the stories of the first time he prescribed prozac yeah and the person was like wow finally i can deal with life because even though we say it just numbs down the brain it's not really solving the issue that itself could be huge for a lot of people mm. that because like the internal noise is so much that if it's numbed down it's really useful. I think what he has issues with is that there are certain things, for example, for which the data shows the drugs are doing sometimes just like the placebo, which is like the sugar pill. Mm. So he says we, in those situations when we know the drug is it really has no impact, but they are still uh, being prescribed, which is what's really sad. Or for age groups for which the, there is no data. Still, the drugs are being prescribed. And at some point, it shows it's more about money than it is about having the best interest of people at heart. I think that's what he has issues with. Yeah. So one is that it's being prescribed in places where there's no data. So, for example, he says for certain types of trauma, the data shows that the drugs don't help and they're still being prescribed. Um, and another thing is even for places where it helps the person like deal a little bit better, it's what she said. He said, that doesn't really solve the underlying root of the trauma. That just numbs down the brain so the person can handle the noise. Then, together with another therapy or whatever reason, they need to solve the issue. So, in other forms, drugs don't solve the issue. But in many cases, they may help the person be in a place and get to a place where they can go and get the help and, and, and do it. Which takes me to what I really like about his approach. His approach is that for me, the most important thing is for my patient to feel better. And I'll try different techniques to help them there, which is really golden for, for, for someone to say that. Because now I've seen a lot of professionals in this area who, because they know one form of modality, they keep forcing down, that, down the person. And if it doesn't work, they're like, oh, you're not thingy. You, you're treatment resistant. No, maybe you don't know the techniques, the other techniques, Mm. you know. So it's like, I'll try different things, see which one works. But yeah, these drugs, last night as well, BBC, I don't know, Panorama, if you saw, they did a story on antidepressants. That was interesting. One day we need to maybe talk about that. Um, That one was good, the BBC Panorama on like, the idea there was that a lot of the times the long lasting impacts of being on antidepressant hasn't been studied well or hasn't been told to people mm. and how withdrawal after a long time of having them like uh, that's a maybe different discussion but i just wanted to put that out there do you want to do ratings before we get into like a longer discussion okay sure let's yeah. go so uh, as always we go with readability uh practicality and depth or quality of insight yep so readability what did you give it? Do you remember? Readability, I think seven I gave it. Seven? I I wrote down seven and a half, but I, I yeah. think seven, seven and a half. I, I think for, for, again, a casual reader like myself, um, initially it was very overwhelming. And I find this is the case even with, um, what was that book that we did? Uh, the Righteous Mind? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Jonathan so, Haidt. Jonathan Haidt. So even with that book, like initially... But this is easier than that, no? No, I, again, th- you got to understand this is your... like oh, You, you study this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so like coming to, coming to, to, to terms with, with the terminology and the, the, the theories and like, you know, it is quite a scientific book. But once you kind of get into the flow of things, it's it's really interesting. Um, practicality, do you remember what you gave? Eight. I Eight? Think, I, think I gave so. it a six. Okay. Because I found, again, um, it was... Uh, not as practical in my opinion. But Can I say practical in what sense? Yeah, go on. Practical in the sense that imagine someone says, okay, I feel like I'm, I'm, I've got symptoms that I feel like it could be related to trauma, but I don't know how to understand that. Yeah. I feel like for someone who's confused in this, reading this book will give them a lot of next steps of what to do. Like it may give them okay, a lot of yeah. interesting things. First of all, they'll learn all the different sources available for them. Yeah, like EMDR, yeah. neurofeedback, yoga, the talking therapies, IFS. So the person, it, it may give the light for the next steps. What should I do? 
what should I focus on? I think, and this is like a separate discussion, but I think the, the issue then is also the accessibility of, of uh, these kind of resources. Because like if we talk about the NHS, you have CBT is usually what's prescribed. Yeah. But getting access to all the alternative therapies that he discussed, like EMDR and whatever else, I don't know how people would access yeah, that. Yeah. Which is why I, I kind of gave it a slightly low practicality score. Quality of insight, I'll go first. Uh, I think it's a 10. Um, because it was just like very eye-opening, very extensive, almost like no stone was left unturned when, yeah. when discussing the topic. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I gave it a 10. I think so too. Yeah? 10, yeah. All right. Similar, I mean, so your, your rating overall is slightly better than mine. Yeah. But yeah. Um, all right, so second half of the podcast, I mean, we've already kind of started this, but yeah. the second, second half of the podcast we call the epilogue because mm. it's book related. Um, but we kind of explore the, the topics and the themes in a little bit more depth yeah um i'd be interested to know if you had any particular critiques of the the book the methodology the presentation of it um a anything you would say because i know you you study this stuff you talk about this stuff quite a lot um how does that reconcile with your kind of uh philosophy or perspective on 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 the subject okay okay before the critique should we just I think I would like to praise the book a little bit first sure. because I, I think it's good as well for people to know what are they dealing with. Mm. Like I feel like if, if we have therapists, counselors, uh, or people who basically are in this field, maybe even life coaches really, who I think this would be a great book for them. So I just want to say this, but that doesn't mean that uh, people who are not in this field wouldn't benefit. I think even for ordinary people, who like watching podcasts on trauma, people who enjoy watching Gabor Mate. I think you what would be... What did you just say? Gabor Mate. Is that watching, he's one of the... I've never heard of him. Really? No. We're going to do some of his books in the future. He's one of the most famous people right now talking yeah. about trauma. I think he just switched languages all of a sudden. No, no. He's actually... Uh, 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 he's one of the ones who made trauma trendy right now, to be honest with you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, The Myth of Normal, his book. Very good book. So I'm the thinking... Michael Jordan of trauma. Almost. <laughs> if someone enjoys watching those type of podcasts, yeah. I think it would be worthwhile spending the time to study this book even, I would say. And it's one of those books that if you get this one, it's worth 10 books. Mm. You know, sometimes it's even meatier than Gabor Mate's books. And Gabor's m books are not as meaty as this. I remember the name now. That You, you, you suggested one of his books instead of this, I yeah. think, on trauma. Yeah, I was saying, I suggested both. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we chose this one. They're yes, both very yes, famous. Okay, the myth that. of normal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At some point, we'll do that. Maybe a few things. But I'm saying if someone enjoys that, mm. I would say study this too. This yeah, is meatier, yeah. juicier. So, so that's out there. I like a few things, approaches he has, which not everyone in this field actually has. Mm. This humbleness that ultimately what matters is the person, not what I'm good at. So one of the things I really liked about him is that he's very good at certain modality. Then he realizes a new thing is in town, EMDR, which he has no idea about. He doesn't get defensive about it. He's like, okay, show me what's the data. And he goes it, learns it, does studies on it. I like this because mm. I feel like this is what's really lacking with a lot of people right now. I've even seen people who go to professionals who really treat them like trash. Like, no, nah, you can't be solved. That's it. Like, my knowledge is all there is. But he was very open. He went and learned EMDR. He went and learned IFS. He went and learned all these things to be able to help people. I think with IFS, he met someone at a conference. Yeah. And the guy was like, this works. And he goes... Have and he was like, let's try He's it. like, have you done any clinical? Is He's like, no, it's not been proven, yeah. but I guarantee you it works. Yeah. And he goes, all right, then let's, yeah. let's do it. Let's and try then he it. goes and does the studies and he does as it, well. Yeah, yeah. So, so that is a very precious approach. Mm. And this idea as well that they had of let's make different things accessible for people because every person may arrive at their healing in a different way. Yeah. And so then yoga for another person theater for another person playing for another person this is i think what ultimately is lacking in the culture right now like th the wider culture is not like this and if you read this book you may feel like wow we're in heaven right now trauma is we've got all the solutions everything mm. but as you said you have a trauma you go seeking help at best you get six sessions of cbt <laughs> and yeah, yeah. then out but but he 
cre- at least in terms of vision, he's seeing what the society could look like. This is actually one of the places in which I got the vision for the center in sh- that we're hoping to start. Yeah. Like there has to be games there. One of the uh, stories he mentions is that of a friend of his colleague of his that he said he had become very good of helping children with trauma and had nothing to do with talking it was like he would walk in the corridor and if he saw a child that's like very like you know reserved not engaging he would just pass and say hi and that was a seed he's planting next time he comes throws a ball Hmm. next to them they don't care third time he comes throws a ball then they throw it back and just this engaging and throwing a ball starts a moment of this kid connecting to someone like you know like being ba- like i feel like this book is is that place where science and art meet together like in order to help someone out of this thing out of their past out of this prison that trauma was created for them we need to be creative we need to have different tools so i think that's a praise i have for the book now now coming back to the critique critique that also shows trauma is not uh, and and i get why a scientist would have to have such definition of trauma but when 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 a book tells me that um, social support helps trauma um, or tr- theater helps trauma, being part of community helps trauma, this helps trauma, this helps trauma, then by the end of it, it makes me think, okay, fair enough. So trauma seems like to be a thing that life helps it. it, it I feel like trauma is something terrible happened in life. And part of me shot down against life and world. Mm. It, it, it's, it's, it's much bigger than what they say. You know, it's much bigger than an, a, a mental disorder, a mental health condition. Trauma is a relationship. Like, I think it's an existential reaction to life when life gets difficult. That's why right now, when someone like Gabor Mate on YouTube describes Twitter, 70% of people are like, yeah, I'm, I'm trauma. I'm, I, I. Now, a lot of people who even talk to me, they, they, they say I have trauma. And many of them haven't gone through accidents or wars, although some of them have gone through abuse. So what is this thing that a lot of us feel like we relate to it? And like, like some of the symptoms of trauma are what? Like difficulty to connect to the present moment. You know, difficulty to relax, difficulty to or difficulty to connect. A lot of people feel these symptoms. And I feel like trauma is a very is a very broad thing at some point, which is a person's um, person has gone through a life condition that by the end of it, their approach to life is that I don't find life an enjoyable process. Life is more negative than positive. And this is a, sp- a spectrum. It can be someone like David Goggins who saw his dad bringing the pistol out on them and hurting their mother, and which a lot of people unfortunately go through that too. And it could also be a smaller thing. Someone seeing, for example, that, okay, I'm seeing my brother being ill. I'm seeing my sister in pain. I'm seeing my father. And it could be a loving person, but if they cannot make sense of what's happening in life, then their reaction towards life becomes life is something that I can't make sense of. And somehow that will have its impact on the way we live. Mm-hmm. It will either make us shut down part of our emotions or it will make us resentful or make us, or it makes us come up with a solution to solve that which may be unhealthy. I have to be super rich to protect myself. Do, do you not think though that the, the issue specifically with this is that a lot of people are not equipped in early life. They're not given the tools in early life to be able to deal with traumas later on. So their coping mechanisms or the way that they, they deal with life is is very confined. And then anything that exists outside of that just becomes something they can't deal with. And that's where they fail to reconcile. Yeah, yeah. But, and I don't think that's some people. I think that's m- almost all people. Mm. So I, I think... So I, it, it, sorry to think you, but is, is trauma just a natural part of life then? No. So so, so that's the thing. See, l- look, let's take the steps because we don't want to be like... Um, so one aspect of it is that that life-threatening thing we call that trauma right being in a war being abused um, these kind of things sexual abuse or i don't know domestic violence all of that like that one event which you can say oh this life-threatening event so that's the uh, being in a war that was the classic trauma 
Then slowly, slowly, we realized, okay, people who haven't gone through that are showing similar symptoms. That's, for example, how they realized that, okay, it doesn't need to be that one life-threatening event. So they came up with complex trauma, which is now maybe small things, but consistently. So maybe just like not, parents not listening to you, it's not a war, but it happened through such a long time and when I was very vulnerable. So I'm saying when you take the step from that classic trauma to complex trauma, which is when you see a lot of people are showing the symptoms of being in a war where they haven't been, but they've been in a... Then I'm saying now I'm starting to see another step. This is like me stretching it a little mm. bit. I'm saying from complex trauma, now what I'm seeing is that people who may not have been even in families that were that... Uh, avoidant or negligent are showing similar symptoms you know like and, and this is not to undermine anyone's story but actually is to s validate everyone's story and in sense, before you would say okay if a per complex trauma would be from what family maybe the father is alcoholic maybe the father is gone it's a single mother who's got issues for example dealing with addiction whatever that would then show enough attention to the child or maybe the mother's going through post-mortem depression is not there for the child. Maybe, maybe. But then you see, okay, we're living in a culture <laughs> where it seems like a lot of children coming from all sorts of families are showing these signs of trauma. So at some point, you realize, okay, it seems like life itself is a trauma for us right now, you know, which is what leads to Gabor Mate's book. He says, we've created a society that even if you're from a normal family, it leads to trauma. So maybe something fundamental about our culture and our society is wrong, that life itself is a trauma, you know? And this is uh, one of the things I say, this, this is an existential thing at this stage. So trauma is not just like an illness, it's like a life condition, <laughs> you know? And our life is traumatic, it seems. I feel like we are, as a culture, as a society, finding life trauma. Why? Which, going a little bit because the way we've built the society and when i say we, we it's not like a lot of people have been involved in it but for whatever reason maybe part of it is lack of our engagement we have a society that's not natural for the development of a human being if you remember one of the early podcasts we did on that we said that a child needs to for every child you need a village to support it mm. and back then you had that but now what, in which situations are children born? Because, you know, if you said, if you remember, we said for a child not to get trauma, the safest, strongest protection is social connection. Okay, what is social connection in this culture? People have the least amount of close friends, extended families out of the picture. You're only going to see your parents who are going to be so busy thinking about rent and whatnot. No cousins, no aunts, no community. Um, uh, you know, the cost of living. So... Uh, it, 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 adds, it, it means that we've created the life that, that it's traumatic. Even if you're in a very normal family of parents who love you, you're going to get up and show all signs of trauma. And then you think you have terrible parents, which is what happens in a lot of people. Mm. Kids come to me and say, oh, my father is a terrible father. And I'm like, I get what you're saying, huh? but it's not his fault. This is way bigger than any family. A lot of this has to do with the society we're living in, you know? Um, yeah, it's a bit um, bleak. Uh, I think the outlook. Yeah, I'm. I'm just trying to think. Um, I guess where where do we go from here? Because I I understand what you're saying, and and I I always look at previous generations, um, and especially you know immigrant families, for example. Uh, my my family history, for example, my my dad and his siblings and parents were kicked out of uganda came to the uk as refugees like that was you know the, the family was split up all of these things those are these are those like wartime kind of uh things where it's like significant moments in life where your life is just flipped on its head yeah overnight um but then yeah like you said you you look at society today and there is uh a lot more conversation around mental health and around trauma and and all of these kind of things um but you're attributing it i guess in in some regard to the the societal structure that we have here 
That's one of the theories. Not just here, huh? because the same lifestyle is almost everywhere. Well, in, in, in the world today. Yeah. So that, that's definitely one, one aspect of it, I would say. The, the change of lifestyle mm. that, that has led to this. That's one thing. But there's another theory as well Jonathan Haidt has that yeah. complements this. Sorry, go on. No, I, I was going to say, you, you can talk about the other theory, yeah. but I, I don't want to end on like a, a bleak, okay, this is the world, this is where we live. I would like some hope. Okay. Can you can you provide uh, an alternative, not an yeah. alternative, but a future path where you think that we can break out of this cycle of trauma, if we can call it that, or just this world where everyone is suffering and unable to reconcile their lived experience with what's what's happening yeah. in the world today? Yeah. So th there's a few places that we can go. And, and if you agree, let's go to all of them because I think all of them may help the person have all the pieces they need in order to think about it because yeah. we don't want anyone to agree. We actually want them to engage in the discussion. But mm. I want to say everything, at least some of the things I think so they can engage with it. You have 10 minutes. Number one, I have more than enough. <laughs> one of the things is this. Okay, now that we know what are some of the missing pieces in the society that leads to life just not being... Uh, 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 Life is doesn't sound like a gift anymore. Let me just say it that way. And this would lead to trauma because life is what you're doing every moment of your yeah. life. So we need to find ways of making life a gift. I think for a lot of people, spirituality is massive in this. Spirituality would be a very help because spirituality is your relationship with life itself. Not one event in it, but the whole thing. So once your relationship with the whole things, then your relationship with the events, how you make sense of them, how you re-engage with them will change. That's a massively huge thing. And the data also shows there's good books on that. Maybe one day we can of like how through spirituality people manage to heal traumas, which they were struggling with for years. So spirituality is a massive help community and community doesn't need to be like a big thing. Two families together, three families. People knowing that more than your income, what matters for your child is that you being there and you being in a very good, present, relaxed situation. Like that is the best investment you can do for your child, more than the money, more than the house. Because I feel like for a lot of people, my generation and a little bit older, they were not necessarily in the best condition. So when they got a little bit wealthy you're like let me give my child the best house the best car the best toys that's not what's going to get your child out of trauma it's your presence so even if your salary is 10k less but you're there more it's going to be an investment you wish you would make 10 years from now so and, and there are good books on that as well which we can later on read knowing that the most precious thing we can give our child is our calm presence you know and if, if, if you know that people were in a war zone, but just because their parents were there next to them, they didn't get a trauma. Like that's huge, the impact parents have on a child's life. Not to put pressure on them, but, but know that more, because I feel like now parents are distracted. There's so much expectations of them. Work on your children's texture thingy. Get them different textures to touch. Read them this, do that, do get this app. And all of this distracts them and puts so much pressure on them that just be with them. <laughs> Even if they know what to do, you know, mm. what you do matters less than just doing anything. And I feel like parents in this culture are pressured so much. I went to see one of my cousins, poor thing. She bought 20 different things. So I need to help my child with her texture thing, then with his IQ. Otherwise, she, he would be dumb. Then do this, then do that. Then I was like, relax. She was so stressed. Mm. And this is a, a mother that 20 years later on, if you say that, you know what, you weren't really that present with your child. Like, what do you mean? Like, yeah, in your effort to be there for the child, they pressured you. You shouldn't be pressured. And another thing as well, it's good to know that children are not that fragile. As long as you're there with them, actually going through difficulty makes them stronger which is Jonathan Haidt's book. It says one of the reasons why we got weaker uh, in the new generation is that we had in, our, I mean, in the next generation, actually, parents our age and a little bit older were so much there for their children. And he, they're not listening to them, but they're supervising them. They're not as a partner of playing, they're as a person who controls them. Don't do this, don't go outside. And this created the weaker uh, generation. And, and not that it's their fault but you didn't allow them to go through that difficulty. Mm. 
um, um, and, and, and so it's, it's less about supervising them. It's less about controlling. It's less about making sure everything is perfect. It's more about being there, being their partner, playing with them, right? So, so doing less sometimes actually achieves more. Like helicopter parenting is one of the things Jonathan Haidt attributes to a generation that sometimes even finds, for example, through no fault of their own, a speech, a trauma. Like the speech, give me trauma. What is helicopter parenting? Helicopter parenting is like you're always there. Like if they're playing, you're watching how they play and you're monitoring every aspect of their you know, thing. Mm. If, for example, it's a sleepover, you're managing everything. You've, you've got a plan. This 10 minutes you do this, then afterwards you do that. You know, as opposed to like go out and play. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so that's another thing which I think this, this knowing this about ourselves is so important. The fact that people are anti-fragile. If they are, and that's the last thing I say by the way. If people are in a situation in which they have support, people they trust, then they are very strong. Not just that, but pressure makes them stronger. This concept Nicholas Nassim Taleb have of anti-fragility. He says there are three things. Well, maybe we can, in his book we we'll talk about it. But I just feel like this would be a good way of cycling it, uh, circling it back to David Goggins as well. David Goggins as well uh, went through so much trauma. We went like half of his life is trauma. What made him not only come out of it, survive it, but use that in his own thing? And, and, and it says it's this idea that we need to accept that human beings when in the right circumstances not only pressure doesn't get to us pressure makes us stronger we're not fragile we're not the opposite of fragile we're anti-fragile so with more pressure we become stronger so the idea is not that let's create a pressure-free environment for my children and myself let's create a safe environment in which pressure makes them stronger but pressure has to be there mm. and then yeah i think that's enough i talk too much well, <laughs> um yeah, I think, I mean, obviously we knew going into this, it's a, it's a heavy topic, it's a heavy book. Yeah. Um, but th definitely uh, l anyone that wants to, to understand people better, um, it's a good book to read because cause just even I think in your own life, you can look back on, on micro traumas yeah. as, as they might be um, and, and trying to understand things. I just quickly, because we, we didn't actually discuss it, but IFS... Um, the integ integrated fam family internal family structure internal think, family structure Structuring or system yeah um, but that's the one where he basically uh, introduces physical objects that's so fascinating so so uh, I would I would do it but I'll let you because you'll do a better job of it but yeah. can you just very quickly in like two minutes summarize how it works sure this is a very fascinating one for myself as well yeah. I remember the first time I read the book this is one of the things that really stayed yeah, with yeah, me yeah. It's basically the idea he uh, uh, he says that so you're next to the person who's basically arranging this and then you use different objects in the room to to create a map of your relationship. So, for example, of the important people in your life, basically. So, they, for example, they ask you, OK, what uh, it could be either people or object mm. with people. It's even more interesting. Uh, like, okay, who do you want in this room, for example, to so, be... So they do like a group session. Yeah, it's a group session. They have session. someone kind of facilitating, and then the per the one person is chosen to kind of uh, map out their relationship. Yeah. So like, for I example, they're like, who do you want in this audience to be this key figure in your life? Let's say your father. Yeah. And then, for example, I look in the audience, I'm like, this person would be my father. Like, where do you want him to be, right? If I'm making a mistake, please correct me, by the way. Yeah. So you're like, okay, I want him to stand there. I want him to sit here next to me. You, 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 you place them somewhere in the room. Mm. And it can also be done with objects as well. Like in, in his, I think in his own example, he used objects, like the sofa should be there. So, so I, I think what was interesting in his own example, so he thought that he had like, he was all well adjusted, yeah. you know, life was good, whatever. And, and that his parents who were quite old and were you know, past retirement, yeah. uh, didn't have any impact on his life or whatever. He picked a bunch of objects um, and placed them strategically in the room. And his parents, he had picked like these huge, I think, chairs. He had like a massive sofa, sofa yeah. that he stood up. Um, and that was his, his father and his mother as, as two, two of these two objects. And everything else was like small. So I think his kids were like a small lamp or something like that. Mm. And, and essentially what kind of you realize is that the, the physical objects that you choose and the location that you place them in the room uh, is almost like a manifestation of... of how 
you perceive them. Yeah, yeah. So, so for him, he realized that that he saw his parents as being kind of overbearing or, um, you know, quite significant in his life and 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 quite almost intimidating. Yeah. In comparison to everything else in his yeah. life. And and the interesting thing is that he said before going like doing it, he didn't know this is what would come out of it. Yeah. But he says that the moment they ask you where should we place this person, he says like you immediately know. Like he says, even the cases that he tried, the person immediately has an answer that, yes, for example, my brother has to be there eight meters back, a little bit to the left. Yeah, that's where he is. Like, it's as if like you, you know exactly where mm. people are subconsciously in your relationship with them. And now once you map out the situation and now from there, you find a way to a, maybe a, a, a more healthier place for things to be. Well, either this is by replacement or by uh, sometimes talking. So for example, in one incident, which was very interesting for me, um, so they got someone to play the role of this person's mother and someone to play the role of uh, her father. And they went back to that moment of trauma and they say, why do you wish your father would have told you? And this person now who's pl playing the role of her father said, had I been an ideal father, when you came to me with that truth, this is how I would have reacted. And the person gets what they would have required to get at that moment to manage to go through it. Because we ultimately said trauma is when you go through a difficult time and you don't get the support. So they take you back and now these people outside take the role of people who should have supported you back then and now they give you the support. It was fascinating. So so I don't know if we've done it justice by, by, by yeah. describing it, but... Um, yeah, when I read that, I was I was mind blown because again, he gives example after example, and and he shows the impact that it has on on people, and, and and just as you said, like just having somebody who's playing that role say the things or do the things that that you would have wanted from your yeah. parents, from your partner, from your friends, whatever, uh, it allows you to kind of reconcile and almost like heal and close off that chapter of trauma, um, in, in a in a way that that almost sounds too good to be true. Yeah. Um, but that was really interesting. I, I just wanted to bring yeah. it up because we, yeah. we hadn't these, discussed yeah. IFS. These things are, by the way, for someone who's a little bit maybe skeptical about these things. Yeah. Obviously, none of these things are going to work for everyone, which is one thing he says. That's why he's offering so many. Yeah, yeah. So it's not like any of these is a magic bullet. But a lot of these are more powerful seen in action than described. Because I've actually done this in our own uh, thingy, uh, in my own uh, counseling training, like psychotherapeutic counseling training. This is one of the things we actually practice. Not this form of it, something inspired by this. Yeah. So there's only one person involved. Uh, like if you had a relationship that was troubling, a person comes and becomes that and you do. Before that, me and many of my like people in the course were like, like, this is silly. Like I'm an adult. What the hell is this? But it's so unbelievable how immediately it feels like it's real. Like that person, you genuinely think this is the person that I had an issue with. Mm. And and then so when they something say something, it actually makes a huge impact. Even in some NLP um, courses, they do similar things. Like if you've had a fight with someone, they role play that. So it, it's interesting in different ways of basically. Anyways. So <laughs> I think that, that we, we can we can draw uh, this chapter to a close. Um, so next podcast, uh, we haven't finalized, but if you're happy no, to go, go ahead it. with, yeah, so we, we had discussed, so I, I'm, I'm reading currently, uh, Mo Godat's book, Soul for Happy. Uh, a friend recommended it a while ago and I just got around to, to reading it and, and I found it to be really interesting and, and, uh, a, a very nice read, um, and really uplifting and positive and, and his perspective, just to give a very brief overview, his son died at the age of 21, um, uh, through like a, a, a medical uh, mistake essentially and um he's always because he's an engineer he's a super successful ex google ceo or coo or whatever CFO. it's all the same come on yeah. c-suite guy <laughs> um and and he, he he because he's so smart he was like i need to have a formula for happiness so he had this formula and obviously it was tested to the max when his son passed away but he just kind of uh demonstrates and 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 shows his understanding of the world and and it's it's a nice read i think it's a lot lighter and a lot different from from what we've just read 
but I think it would be a good book to cover. Um, and I've I've really enjoyed it. I'm almost done now. Okay. Um, so if you, how hurry, many hours are we talking? Oh, we're talking about an hour and a half left. I think. No, no, no. After the, the whole, whole book. book. I don't know what because sp- I, I listened to it at like one point five speed. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it's like ten hours, eight, eight, eight to ten hours in total. Okay, that's not. Which too is bad. not too bad. Yeah, this was what like fourteen. Yeah. Yeah, this is a good book. We don't okay, read books next one. on this podcast. We just listen to them. We listen to them. Um, but it's it's narrated by him, um, which is really nice. Yeah. That's um, good. and yeah, so I, that that's that's going to be next podcast, and that's it. We're done. I think so. Are we done? I think Anything yeah, else? I do we normally? Oh yeah. Sorry. If you are before you do your whole one, I know what you're gonna say. Yeah. Everyone knows, but yeah. <laughs> if you are um, listening for the first time, then please do subscribe. If you're watching on YouTube, subscribe. and if it's their first time, it's not always this bad. <laughs> it's not always this <laughs> dense a topic. Um, I wouldn't say it was bad. No, I'm saying it's bad, so maybe they will. They think the other ones are better. No. Oh, then what? Like, no, it's not. Isn't too bad. You know, if we say it's good, they're gonna say it's bad. I'll, I'll tell you later okay, on. It's fine. like basically a okay, that's technique. Fine. But yeah, uh, do subscribe. Um, also, give us like a nice five-star rating with a nice comment. Um, you can comment on Jawad's jokes or whatever no, it is no. that he does. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. And then, yeah, this is not a book club. Yeah, five out of ten. <laughs>